Every one of your prayers must eventually turn to praise. When you cry out to the Lord of hosts, your perspective begins to shift. From inward to outward, from having eyes set on your preferences and anxieties and the worries of this world, to setting your eyes on Jesus. So today, you're called to respond. He has set his king on Zion, so you can know his relief is coming. He hears every single one of your prayers. He will restore your joy. For in him alone can you find safety from the storm. So you can trust him. Indeed, he's the God of justice. And when he sees your pain, he does not remain seated. But he stands up and he covers you with the shield of favor. So you can cry out boldly in the wilderness or in the valley of the shadow of death, a holy cry of longing, of suffering, but also of praise. You can believe that salvation has come from Zion, for Jesus was poured out like water, forsaken so that you would never be. So today, beside the still waters and under the protection of his staff, Give him the glory due his name, for the king has forgiven all your transgressions. He has brought you in to taste and see his goodness, and to be still and know that he is God. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is Psalm 34, and you'll find that on page 463 of your Bible, and if you don't have one, please find one under the chair in front of you. My name is Christy Sheridan, and I've been a covenant member of the Door Church for 11 years, and I've served in various volunteer capacities over that time. Once again, we'll be in Psalm 34, page 463. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires his life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is God's word. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are gathered here in the name of your Son, Jesus. We ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit, our hearts would be joyfully open to your word. 
please bless Scott with the insight, humility, and faithfulness to preach Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Christy. Um, if you're new here, my name is Scott Brooks. I'm the lead pastor on the preaching team. Super grateful for you to be here. And so uh, everyone should have got one of these old TC Kids bookmark. And on the backside, there's a QR code. And that was strategic. You're like, why did I get this? Because we need your help. Um, we've been talking about this summer. As you see, lots of kids in here. It's been a time of uh, really a family worship with a lot of kids uh, and rest for our volunteers, but also uh, of recruitment. And so this is the time we need you to respond uh, in two weeks, we have TDC kids fully opening back up with school, and we're super excited about that opportunity to, to gospel these kids. We have to turn kids away uh, quite frequently because we don't have enough volunteers to disciple these kids. And I have in my notes, like, um, you know, it's two hours uh, per month because it's every other week, and um, I have another one that says that it, we're all the grandmas, you can hold kids. And as I was writing, I was like, I, I was just like, come on, like, you, we are discipling kids, Here's an opportunity to tell kids about Jesus. Like, if that's not enough, I, you know, I'm a little concerned. Uh, we have an opportunity to bless kids with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make disciples. And if you're not serving somewhere in this community, I'm going to ask you to pray about why. Why am I not serving? This is a great way to discipline your life and your heart to do something that Jesus commands. And so with that said, man, you can just fill this out on your on, uh, on online. Just take a picture with your phone. It'll, it'll, it'll take you to the volunteer, but we need your help. Um, we don't want to turn kids away from uh, gospeling uh, them on a, on a weekend, so consider it. Uh, we need your help. Two weeks, so get in the game. You get to, and I'm telling you, as you disciple, not only will you um, get to know these kids and their families, you will get more of Christ. He said it's, it's better, better to, to give than receive in the sense of men, it's better to serve. So think about your life, think about where your joy is, and it's actually better just to serve and you will be blessed. Um, we need your help. Today is the day. Today is the day that we need you to respond, okay? This has uh, all been moving to this point. Get off the bench, into the game. All right, if not, I'll start calling you and then it'll be real awkward. Um, all right, Psalm 34. What's interesting about Psalm 34 is uh, it gives us like a little, a, a little subscription here uh, before it gets into verse 1. And I just want to pay attention to that before we get uh, deep into Psalm 34. It says this, of David, so it tells us who, who's writing the psalm, uh, of David when, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. So context is always important. But it's super important here. Why? Because it tells you the context. So it's like, hey, I want you to read this psalm in light of the context of what's going on in David's life. And it tells us it's when he, he changed his behavior to, to get away from Abimelech. It only does that, uh, this is only one of 14 times in the, in the book of Psalms where it tells you the context. So it's, it really highlights to the background of what's going on. And again, this is when he acted crazy. So David, I just want to start with David. I don't want everyone to assume. Uh, David is, a, is, a, um, is a, a very known character in Scripture. Uh, but but king, king David, he wasn't necessarily king at this time. He was definitely appointed to be king. He had some very high points in his life, if you know his story. Like, man, like, he, he, he should walk with some swag. If, if you're King David, know why? He killed Goliath. Like, everyone knew that, everyone was scared of Goliath. I mean, he'd go out every day, just call out the whole Israelite army. No one's stepping up to fight that dude. He's a young boy. He gets out a sling, slings a rock, knocks David down, goes off and chops his head off. It's like a legit story. He's like, man, I did that. And then it, he protected Israel from the Philistine. That's a big feather in your hat. Uh, I'd probably put that on some type of media for me if I was just doing self-promotions. Like, I don't know if you know, but I killed Goliath, right? And that's a, that's a big deal that he has uh, to build up his reputation. Uh, I mean, we still, you know, it's David and Goliath. We still use that language today when there's a, a story of lesser versus greater. It's like it's miraculous, and his name is forever tied to that. That's a high point in his life. Uh, he was anointed king, if you know that story. Samuel uh, was supposed to bring all his, his sons out. For, he forgets about David because David's little. And man, God looks at his heart, anoints his, him as king. And he's just kind of this king in a waiting as Saul is there. Another one, that's, that's making me feel good about myself if I'm David, right? Killing Goliath. I'm anointed to be the future king of, of Israel. Um, as we get into the, the context of 1 Samuel 21, uh, it talks about as Abimelech sees 
uh, David in, in Gath, this is what it says in 1 Samuel 21, verse 11. It says, Saul has struck down his thousands. So Saul's pretty awesome, but he's not as awesome as David is his 10,000. They wrote songs about this man, about how he was able to take out armies. Again, that's another feather in their hat. Like he, he probably walked with a lot of uh, bravado, if you will, a lot of pride to t- be taking place in life. Just like, I don't know if you know, but you know, I'm kind of a big deal. That's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that's what he was thinking, but I know that's what I would be thinking if I, if I was able to accomplish this in my life. There's probably things in your own life that you're very proud of. Like, I don't know if you know this, but I've done some, some big things. Now, he's also had some very low points in his life. This is where we're going to find him here in this text. Very, very, uh, really sombering po- points. Um, what we see here in the context of uh, 1 Samuel 20, 21, is yes, he was appointed to be the king of Israel, but King Saul was still the king, and he was on the run from King Saul. So a king, his, his, his countrymen won, wanted to, to kill him. Why? Because he is a perceived threat. So his country and his king were after him. And so he's on the run. Imagine that's not a good point to be in your life. When you're on the run from the people that you're supposed to be the king over, uh, he's, he's, he's running from them because he's, he's scared for his life. Uh, in this um, really terror, he, he makes a really interesting choice of where to hide. I mean, I could see the wisdom there and what he's thinking. He's like, you know what? Uh, the king of Israel's after me, and he's, he's looking to kill me. You know where he'll never look is Gath. That's where Goliath's from. So I'm going to go run to Philistine country where they're not going to, they will never look for me there. Why? Because they're enemies. So he's going to try to go hide out where he thinks would be the safest, which is in the enemy territory. Well, he's spotted there. So that didn't seem to be a very bright idea that he's running from his uh, King Saul into uh, foreign enemy territory. Now, what's so interesting, if you read the context, even before, I believe it's uh, 1 Samuel 20, he goes and sees a priest, and he's, he ate some, some bread uh, from, the, uh, from, from, that, from, from the priest that was pretty special, and he had no, he's on the run, had no, he had no sword. He's like, hey, do you have a sword here that I could have? And the priest's like, well, I got, I got the sword of Goliath, the, 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 the giant you slayed, and so he grabbed that sword, so Goliath's sword, and he goes in to Gath, where Goliath's from, and he gets spotted. So he's like, it's like his, 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 his um, men testimony. He's like, I'm the guy that killed Goliath. He's, he has his sword on his side. So you could imagine, man, he's not looking very sharp at this point. And then uh, he gets brought to King Abimelech at, at this point. He's running from his countrymen. He's wearing Goliath's sword. And King Abimelech is, is ready to put him to death because he, he's an enemy uh, of of. Uh, the Philistines. And what's so interesting, he has a bright idea. Uh, not only is he, you know, strong and handsome, evidently a pretty good actor. He, he acted crazy. And so if you know this story, he starts spitting on his beard, like, like just having saliva run down his beard. And he starts scratching on a door uh, like a dog. And then the king was like, you know what? This is clearly a crazy man. Like I, I, he's not even worth putting to death. If this is the man that killed Goliath, I'd rather not kill him. Why? Because he is dealing in so much shame. I want people to see what's become of him. So he is so past far gone. There's like, I'm just going to let this guy go. And so he gets out of this dire situation where he should have been killed because he acted, uh, he acted crazy. So this is where we find Psalm 34 being penned after he's been let go, after he's been set free from acting crazy, after making really bad decisions. And uh, he's probably uh, writing this in the the caves of Adullam, which is also found in 1 Samuel 21. And he's surrounded. So imagine this this future king on the run. He makes a poor decision, acting crazy. I mean, he's sitting in great shame. He's now hiding in a cave. And it says the people that are with him are 400 men uh, that are basically just complete misfits that no one wants to hang out with. They describe these men as people of distress, debt, and bitter. That's the community that surrounded him at this point in his life. And you just got to imagine there's highs and lows in his life. And this high point, he's probably thinking with a lot of swagger, like, look how great I am. I've killed Goliath. I've done great things. I've got this. And then at the next point of his life, he's like, I am so overwhelmed. 
I'm on the run from my country. I'm, in, I'm on the run from the people that want to kill me that are my enemies. I'm acting crazy. This is great despair. And verse 10, I think, highlights just something that we all need to hear before we jump deeper into the text. It says, the young lions suffer want and hunger. The young lions suffer want and hunger. I, I don't know if you're in the high point in your life like David, where you think you got it, or you're a complete low point in your life. But the truth of the matter is we're all young lions to a certain extent that you're never going to find the satisfaction in your life. Like you can't find the contentment in your life that you're looking for. If anything in this world is the, 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 the king of the jungle, which is, I don't, I'm not even sure if lions are in the jungle. I don't always say it that way. But if, if a lion can't be content and satisfy himself, the illustration is like, neither can you. You will never find contentment in your own abilities, your own strength, your own wisdom. There's nothing that you can do to bring about the sufficiency. And this is where he finds himself. Where is their true life? Where is their true life in this world? Because we can't actually grab, grab it ourselves. Not in our high points. If we, if we think it's in our high points, we're going to be too proud. We don't think we need God. If it's our low point, we think God's abandoned us. Where is he at? There's another way that we find life, and that's where we take refuge in the Lord. And this is the whole Psalm of 34. He's like, there's nothing in this life that we can do to satisfy us. We have to look to God, which is our refuge in life. Let's look at verse 1 through 7. I'm a, it's just... So you now you have the context. He's in, he's in a cave surrounded by a bunch of misfits. He's just acted completely crazy and, and made himself a fool in front of everyone. And this is what he writes in, in, in verse 1 through 7. This is his per personal experience and testimony, de despite circumstance of his joy in the Lord. What's what, it, what's what it says. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His, his praise shall what? Be continually on my mouth. So in this, in this cave, in this overwhelming circumstance, I'm, he says, I'm praising God continually. Verse 2, it says that my soul, my soul is boasting in the Lord. My soul is boasting in the Lord. Verse 3, it says, I'm going to magnify the Lord. Ma he's magnifying this, the Lord in this distress and despair circumstance. Verse four, it says, exalt his name together. Verse five, it says, faith, my face is radiant. He's full of life and joy, although in his life, all, he, all he's really is having is, it, is bitterness, but his experience at this moment is his face is radiant. Verse six, he has saved me from my trouble. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord uh, in, 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 in camps me. He's for me. Now, this is David's testimony. So you know his condition, but now he's sharing his, his experience, and he's saying, man, I am overwhelmed in joy, radiant. My, my soul can't, cannot help but, but, but praise the Lord. Now, what's interesting, if we're going to really see, I think, how, how he gets there, and he leads us there, he, he, he's eventually going to invite us there. Verse 4, I think, is actually pretty helpful to understand why is he so overwhelmed in the Lord, so joyful in the Lord. It says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and what? And he delivered me from what? All my fears. Now it's interesting what he says here. He says, he's delivered me what? From all my what? Fears, not just fear. And he didn't say, man, he saved me from Abimelech. I mean, that, that's true because I just told you the context. He didn't just say, he saved me out of Gath. What did he say? He said, he saved me from all my fears. See, what's interesting, he didn't say, you saved me in my circumstance. He actually said, you saved me in my deepest fears. Now, what's interesting is your circumstance, your circumstance is not actually what you fear. Because a lot of people say, if, if I just had a change of circumstance, then I'd be happy. That's a lie. Your circumstances are actually not what you fear. It is those circumstances that reveal actually what you deeply fear. See, it's the circumstances that those sufferings are pressure points in your life that bring about actually what you deeply fear. Now, that's interesting to think about. See, in his suffering, see, most of us is like, he's just, you know, he's, he's scared of Abimelech. He's scared of the Gad. No, he had to be thinking to some extent, I'm, a, I'm, I'm embarrassed to a great de degree of the choices I made. Like, my idea was to run from Saul to my enemy wearing Goliath's sword. You know how poor in wisdom that looks? Like someone's like, hey, so let me just, let me just recap what you thought was a good idea. And he'd be like, yeah, that's exactly what I did. That's, that's embarrassing. What are people going to think? This is, our, this is our future king. 
Man, he's ridiculous. He's a poor king. I mean, how many times in your life that circumstance is actually not what you fear. It's the fear of this, like, <laughs> I am not as wise, and I actually look super, man, just not, not well here. I mean, your reputation's at stake. Um, again, I just double down the reputation. He acted like a dog. That's super embarrassing. I, I, I've been in some low points in my life. I, I've never done that. I'm not like better than him. I was like, I haven't been there. And anyone says like, you know what? He spit on himself continually and he scratched at the door. That was his plan. I'd be like, that's pretty low. <laughs> It'd actually make me feel good about myself to a certain extent. But that's the reputation now that's going to follow him. We're, re we're talking about it today. So there, you've, you've had some low points in my life. And I say, I've never been that low. I've been in some low points. And I'd be super embarrassed if things would, would, would be played out or known more so in my life, but that, that's for all of us. There's some, been some points that like, you did that? And you'd be like, ugh, yeah. Those, those are some fears of being found out. But lastly is just fear of death. He's at a point where he has no power. He's in enemy, enemy territory. He killed, he killed Goliath. He's helpless. He, he's going to be in prison and killed. The death is right there. He is scared to death that he's going to die. But See, he says, he delivered me from all my fears. There's many fears deeply rooted in our heart, seated in our heart. Why? Because we're looking at our circumstance and not, not to him. And that's what he says in verse 5. Those who look to him are radiant. See, those fears, deep-seated fears, man, allow us to see we're not seeing God rightly. We're being overwhelmed by the things in our life that should not be overwhelming to us. See, all our fears will actually grow quiet as we start to, what, fear the Lord. As we see who God is, and if we belong to him, all those things that our reputation, our embarrassments, our sin proclivities, the, the, uh, being fair, afraid to die, as we look to God, what? We become radiant. See, the fear of the Lord is what it says in Scripture, is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the healing balm, hear me, to all your fears. See, it's what actually brings you Healing is actually when you see the Lord right when he's going to try to see you. He says, I want you to look to the Lord. I want you to grow in fear and awe and, and, and just behold who is God and who he is for you. And as you see that, the fears of this world will settle down and actually grow very quiet. Now, he invites us to experience this. So he just tells us his testimony. I'm going to bless the, sword, bless the Lord continually. My boast is in the Lord. I'm going to magnify the Lord. I exult, I exult in the Lord. My face is radiant. He's saying, this is my experience. Then what's so amazing is like, I want you to experience the same thing. He's, he's talking probably to these 400 men because they're just said they're, they're, not good, they're not good space. And he's inviting us this morning. He says, I want you to experience what I just said. I want you to, to be overwhelmed in the goodness of the Lord. I want you to behold the Lord. I want your fears to die down. I want you to, the fear of the Lord to grow. He longs for that for you. Why? Because that's what he experienced. It says in verse 8, it's an invitation. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I want you to experience what I've experienced. Verse 9, it says, oh, fear the Lord, what you saints. It's a, his invitation to people like come and gather and experience the goodness of the Lord. Verse 11, come, oh children, listen to me. He's instructing us in this invitation, this testimony to experience the goodness of the Lord. This is how evangelism happens, if you didn't know. Like if you experience the goodness of the Lord, you know what you're going to go do? You're going to go tell other people about the goodness of the Lord. If you're not sharing the gospel with other people, know why? It's because you're not experiencing the gospel. The most powerful person for evangelism is someone that experienced the Lord. Know why? You cannot help but talk about it. It's like, look what the Lord did for me. Look who he is. Look where I'm finding rest. It, you, don't, you don't have to. You want to. I've said one time I had a piece of gum that was ex extraordinary. I loved it. It lasted long. It didn't melt in my mouth. I like to work out uh, with a gum in my mouth, and it was amazing. You know what I did for the entire week? I talked about that gum to anyone that would listen. And the line is, Jesus is way better than a stick of gum. How do you not get over sharing, like, look of what I experienced. Taste what I am experiencing. This is one reason, and I'll move on to the invitation. This is why we're so passionate about planting churches and having campuses and a decade of development. Now, why? How could we not be? If you experience the Lord, how would you not want to experience the blessing of God and say, I want to be a blessing for other people? You know, that's as he went to Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you 
What? To be a blessing to others. This is the movement of the gospel work. It's always been that way. If you've been blessed by the word, your movement is what? To bring that blessing to other people. And exactly what he's doing today. He says, I want you to experience what, have I, what I've experienced in the Lord. I mean, how amazing. He's not defined by his, his greatest acts. He's not defined by his lowest acts. He is actually finding a different identity, which is the Lord. And this is what he wants you to experience. Now, how do you get that? It tells us in the text, and he instructs us, it, it depends on how you come. See, a lot of us are like, you're hearing me. It's like, I never experienced what David is talking about. I never, I never felt like I've, I've wanted to magnify the Lord. My, my soul exults. I've never wanted to worship him continually. And I'm going to tell you, you probably haven't come rightly. There's a way that the Lord will meet you, but he meets you on his terms. And his terms, it tells us in verse 2. It says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. It says, let the humble, let the humble be here and be glad. You must be humble before you're ever going to experience the Lord. Proud hearts do not experience the Lord. You know when Scripture says God opposes the proud, and what does he do? He gives what? Grace to the humble. The, pre, the prerequisite to, to meet God is a humble heart. Humility is actually understanding that you're not God. So many of us think we're God in our life, and God will not meet you there because you are not God. Do you come to him humbly, understanding that you're under God? Furthermore, not only does it say that we come humbly, verse 6, it says, the poor man cried. Most of us will not describe ourselves as poor. We don't like to think of us that, that way. We actually think like we're, we're not rich, but we're, we're kind of middle class in spirit. I'm a pretty good person. No, you're not. You're not a good person. Scripture refuses to say that. Your life <laughs> continually demonstrates that's not true. But Christianity is not for the kind of good people. It's the people that understand their poverty. If you, again, look at the context, David is surrounded by 400 broken men that he's telling you about, not the sufficiency in themselves, but the sufficiency that's in Christ. The 400 men are said to be in distress. God is for those that are in distress, that you have great fears. Have you admitted that you have lots of fears in your life? That's actually not a bad point to be at because now, now you're being honest with yourself. The, the, the people that can admit, I have a ton of fears and I don't know how this is gonna work out. The other one it says about the farm then that they are in debt. You know what you have when you find and you're in deep debt? That you can't pay it off. That you need someone else to pay your debt. That's where you have to be. You can't get out of it. It's so overwhelming. This is where you have to be to come rightly. Furthermore, it says discontent. These are the people that figured out that they're not satisfied in life. So many of us are trying to drink deep with this world, trying to find satisfaction in this temporal world, and it's not going to be found. This is actually what brings us to the end of ourself. And at verse 18, it says this, the Lord is what near to what the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. He saves the crushed in spirit. This is how you come. This is why David's just like exulting. He's like, I just act like a dog. I'm spinning all over myself. I'm running in a cave. I have nowhere else to go but to you, God. That's a great place to be. When you have, it's like, I have nowhere else to go but you, God, is the best place to be. It actually says in Matthew 5, 3, it says, blessed are the what? The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the people who are spiritually bankrupt, that have nothing, that confess, I have nothing before a righteous holy God. I have no negotiating. I, I'm, I'm throwing myself at the mercy seat of God. They're the ones that are going to be blessed and experience the grace of God. That is the prerequisite. You cannot come any other way. It's humble. It's broken. It's poor in spirit. Now, why is that? That's how you taste and see that the Lord is good. Until then, you kind of put, you know, Jesus is like, ah, he's like, you know, he's there. You're like, I believe in God. No, this is not what it's talking about. It's like, behold, behold who he is. Taste and see what he's good. It doesn't say think. It doesn't say think about who he is. So I want you to experience. I want you to, to, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Jonathan Edwards, a, 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 good, a good theologian, said it this way. It's one thing to know that honey is sweet. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 it's good. And Summer's like, oh, honey, that's, you know, that's okay. But back then, that was like a really good, probably delight, honey. It's one thing to know it, but it's a whole different thing to taste it. It's, I feel like we're kind of like stubborn kids at, uh, what's it called again, Sydney? 
Smash cake. You know, first, uh, I asked right before I came out. That's what that was about. A smash cake. If, you're, if, you, if you've ever had a one-year-old kid, you get like a cake in front of them. You're like, hey, you got to try this cake. And you put this cake in front of the kid and the cake, the kid, the first birthday, mom's ready to take a picture and just like looks at it. And I know you got to put it in your mouth. And they're like, no, I don't want You're like, no, taste the cake. It is amazing. Once it hits your lips, you're going to love it. And you like try to like shove the cake in the kid's mouth and it like, you know, stiff arms. That's how we are. Man, he wants us to experience and taste that the Lord is good. We shouldn't be like these stubborn kids that refuse to come. But the way that we come, we have to be open-handed and and, and humble ourselves to try to experience the Lord. Actually, look, look what it says in verse 17. It says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. So a lot of people think like, oh, the righteous people is the one God listens to. That's not what it's saying. Who, who are the ones that are righteous? The ones who cry for help. Those are the righteous ones. Those are the ones that get, get the righteous of Christ to experience the grace of God. The ones who will actually open their mouths and say, God, I need you. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching right now. Somebody's just hearing. How do you taste and see? You cry. Cry out for the Lord. This is something that you have to experience by saying, God, I have nothing before you. I'm humbling myself before you. I am broken. I need you. Test and see that the Lord is good. Experience it by crying out for help. God loves to be your strong help. He loves it. He delights in it. This is why Christ came. Grace always runs downhill, but you got to admit, you need the help. you got to reach for the Lord. And you'll see that he's always reaching to you. It, look, look what it says, and we'll, we'll close here. As you cry for help, this is the promises that, that he will meet you in your cry. Verse 22 it says, The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is how we will exult over the Lord, we'll magnify the Lord. We gotta see one, he is our refuge. Listen, he is our refuge in Christ. In, in Christ, we can have this identity that cannot be changed. So your achievement cannot be your refuge. David had some really good days and certainly bad days. But he's not defined by either. He's defined, what, by the character and nature of who God is for him. You're going to have some really wise moment, and you're going to have some really kind of like, man, that was, that was really dumb, just like David. But you're not defined by your own wisdom, but you're defined by the wisdom of God. You're going to have some really good days where you're like, man, I'm hoping people see my reputation. The other days, like, you want to hide. You're not defined by your reputation. You're defined by his. He is your refuge. Let that be a healing balm to your life that you are his. It's his wisdom. It's his reputation. It's his achievement that defines us. It's his name, not yours. And that's how you start to exult in the Lord. Furthermore, it says he is our redeemer. He is our redeemer. First of all, the thing that, that, that Jesus is our redeemer. Can you imagine what it felt like to be David at that moment where he is literally spitting on himself, acting like a dog, being embarrassed? I mean, that's horrible. But understand that God loves him at his worst moment. Like God sees it and said, man, I'm not ashamed of you, but you're mine. That's what it says in Romans, that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. So many of us are looking at this life just to be loved, and it, you can be loved, fully loved in Christ. You're fully known, fully seen. He sees all of it. He's like, but you are mine. If you, if you cry for help, it will allow the love of Christ to quiet your heart. Furthermore, so many of us are stuck in fear without looking to the Redeemer that you are loved, that he sees it all, but you're in the process of being redeemed by, by, by Jesus as a Redeemer. But furthermore, he, G- Jesus is eternal, he is, has an eternal perspective as he's put redemption on your life. Some of us are so afraid of our lives. We're fearful of everything and everything. Well, because we don't know what's next. And you should be afraid to some extent because there are a lot of bad things that can happen. I mean, I, I, I don't even have a list of how long the bad things are going to happen in your life. There's new things all the time. But if you look to the Redeemer, you see it's eternal and that he has your best interests at hand. And so you don't have to be afraid. Because we can fear the Lord. Because his goodness and mercy will follow me the rest, the rest, rest, rest of my day. Why? Because of who he is. I mean, he's still, I mean, David's still in the cave of Adullam when he's pinning this. 
you go look at the life, he ends up becoming king and God does a lot of great things for him. But it wasn't then. He trusts God that he has a plan for your life. Furthermore, the last thing is as a redeemer that he is good. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you. If you truly see that he's a redeemer, I just read with uh, Deacon last night, and we were talking about Joseph and how his, his brother sold him to slavery, and he got, went down to Egypt, and he got thrown in jail. And, but all the end is like, but God meant it all for good, and he did this thing through him. And, and, and we talked about it with, with Deacon at the very end. He's like, that's incredible. He's like, all these bad things were happening to David, I mean, uh, to, to Joseph. But all the meanwhile, God was doing it for good. That's the promise of the Redeemer in your life. You don't understand everything, but I guarantee, as you look back, he's doing it for good, for his glory and your good, and you can rest and you can exult. If you humble yourself before the Lord this morning, you'll experience a joy that's really unspeakable. But the question is, are you going to cry out for help? Are you going to come to him? Are you going to be stubborn like that little kid's like, no, no, I'm going to do it on my own. The choice is yours, but David is inviting you to taste and to see that the Lord is good. The one way that we're going to get to do that this morning is by taking communion together. This is for people that are crying out to help. So I, sometimes I think we just go through the motions. I hope that's not us. I think it's like, oh, yeah, yeah there's a cup up there. I'm going to take it. No, this is, this is you crying out for help. A sinner who needs a Savior. It's a, it's a tangible, it's like a visible display, like, I need not just a little help, but a lot of help. And we're all in the same boat as a, as a church community. And as you come and take this bread and this juice, it's a representation of the great help that Christ is. That Jesus was broken for you. He was broken for you so you can, so you can put on his righteousness, that you can be made just pure, and that you know there's, there's a redemption in every other, every other of your life. As you eat the bread, let that be a testimony that he is going to redeem every part of your life. And that text is all, all of it. You're like, I don't know about that. He, he does and he will. And as you taste, like say, God, thank, thank you that you're, you're my redeemer. All, all of my life. Furthermore, that juice represents his blood that was spilt for you, that you are forgiven for all your trespass, all your iniquity, all your sin. You're not judged on your worst moment. Why? Because Jesus was judged for you. As far as east to the west, your sins are forgiven. Let that, let that minister your heart as you drink that juice. That God, God says you're forgiven. And listen, you're set free from that. You're not defined by that. You're mine. It's my reputation on you. So this is as, as we come to the table, let this Taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience the goodness of the Lord, that he is your refuge, that he is your redeemer. Now, this is only for anyone that is crying out for help. If that's not your heart, this is not, this is, I just say, this is not for you. But if you are saying, I need the Lord, this is absolutely for you. Come taste in the sea that the Lord is good. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help us to see our condition as broken, helpless, humble us, God. Help us magnify you by tasting and seeing that you're good. I do believe the righteous are the ones who cry out for help because you are our, you're our, you're our help in time of need. And I thank you for the refuge you are in Christ. I thank you for the redemption that we have in Christ. I pray that, Holy Spirit, that you would appropriate the sweetness of the Lord in our lives in particular ways. Whether that's we're embarrassed, our reputation, they were afraid of death that we'd see that Jesus is not embarrassed of us. That he calls us mine, that our reputation is his, his perfection, that we don't have to be afraid of death while he's defeated death. God, I pray that we'd see that you're in process of redeeming every part of our life, that we just surrender to that and say, God, I don't know, but you know. That we'd be grateful for the temple that you give us, but we know that you're, you're outside of time and our life is found in you and hidden in you, that we are going to live for eternity. God, I pray that you'd help us taste and see that the Lord is good. Help us experience what David experienced. That we'd sing. That we'd sing and exult in the Lord. I say in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. You're welcome to the table.